This week has been a wild one for Xorg and Wayland on Linux desktops. We're going to be getting into a bunch of this as well as other Linux and open source news. Let's dive into it by first talking about Ubuntu dropping support for GNOME on Xorg. It's official. Canonical has announced starting with Ubuntu 25.10, it will drop support for GNOME on Xorg. It's moving officially towards Wayland for the Ubuntu session. And this is actually aligning with GNOME's roadmap. We're gonna be talking about this, but GNOME itself is also heavily pushing to a Wayland only session. And that's partially the reason that Ubuntu is forcing this switch as GNOME is their default desktop environment. Xorg will still be available for non GNOME desktop environments using Ubuntu, but X11 apps will now start using X Wayland when they're running GNOME. This marks the end of an era as X11 has been the default Linux display server for decades. And as Wayland is maturing, more and more distributions will start making it the default. And this is just a push by Canonical to do the same. So users who are heavily relying on X11 specific features may need to switch over and use a different desktop environment if you're using Ubuntu. But more than likely, X Wayland will get you where you need to go, at least for now. Either way, this is a big milestone and change in the Linux desktop experience. And speaking on that decision, this week in GNOME, the team has also announced that it is pleased to announce that we have decided to move forward with the removal of GNOME's X11 session. To that end, we have disabled X11 session by default at compile time and have released an early GNOME 49 alpha to get this change into distributions like Fedora Rawhide. The feedback we hear will inform our next steps. Please check out Jordan's blog for more details and check out that blog we will as it is an update on the X11 GNOME session removal. We just talked about how Ubuntu is backing this removal of X11 from GNOME, but let's talk about why GNOME is moving away from X11. Really in short, GNOME is getting rid of the X11 session because they claim it's outdated, hard to maintain, and no longer necessary thanks to Wayland's maturity. They claim there's enough features here, including support for Nvidia, high DPI support, touch support, sandboxing, and more, in order to move forwards with using Wayland only. Also, maintaining both X11 and Wayland has proven to be burdensome and has slowed some development. So that's another reason GNOME plans on getting rid of X11. They claim that removing the old X11 session also helps GNOME standardize behavior and optimize performance on a single backend, which is Wayland. Although they are going to still support X Wayland for the time being, but in the future, I can imagine that they will be dropping this as well. Those are the main reasons why GNOME is switching over to a Wayland only session. And for some of you, this is a big deal. Others, you're already using Wayland and probably don't care. Regardless on your stance on this, we have received pretty big news as a falling out took place on the X11 project leading to a fork. We're gonna get into that towards the end of the video. Before we move on, make sure to smash that like button and go down and subscribe below. YouTube can get finicky and you wouldn't wanna miss another video like this. And speaking about GNOME, the GNOME Foundation has just received a new infrastructure partner, AWS. AWS is now fully sponsoring and hosting all of GNOME's web infrastructure. This is a big deal. GNOME has moved their aging on-premise setup to AWS to handle increasing demand and project growth. Basically, they're getting open source credits and are fully sponsored by AWS at this point. GNOME's infrastructure team now uses AWS tools, including elastic load balancing and the latest Graviton CPUs, which marks an interesting end to an era. GNOME has historically hosted its own infrastructure on its premises. And by moving to the cloud, we have dramatically reduced the maintenance burden achieved by lower latency for our users and contributors and increased security through better access controls. This is a big deal as they even labeled a history of network and storage challenges, which in short, GNOME had significantly expanded in recent years, especially with GNOME Circle initiative, increasing the number of hosted projects. The network and storage strain was basically just a struggle to handle the increased bandwidth and storage demands. They had scalability limitations as managing infrastructure in-house became inefficient and hard to scale. And at the end, GNOME wanted to really modernize its outdated systems and embrace a cloud native setup. And at the end here, they thank AWS for their sponsorship and the massive opportunity they are giving the GNOME infrastructure to provide resilient, stable, and high available workloads to GNOME's users and contributors across the globe. While this is a great step for the GNOME project, it does raise some practical concerns, including 
being independent from corporate influence, as it seems more and more our FOSS infrastructure keeps increasingly relying on the corporate cloud giants rather than being able to be community managed and decentralized. It'll be interesting how the continued involvement of big tech in FOSS, especially with things like hosting our infrastructure here, will play out. As we know, the history of big tech is to really just take what they want from open source projects without necessarily contributing back. I guess this is a way you could say that they are contributing back, but we'll see how all that plays out. I want to know what you think about this in the comment section below, but if you want to level up your Linux experience today, check out my cheat sheet, mind map, checklist, and flashcards all at SavvyNick.com today. As next, I want to talk about a rejection by Linus Torvalds on enabling an access monitoring tool that was actually developed by Amazon. This is kind of funny because it actually made it all the way through. There are some major distributions who have enabled this tool. It's called Daemon. Basically, it was a tool developed by Amazon to help monitor system performance and efficiency. And it actually been merged into the 6.15 kernel enabled by default, which is very interesting as other maintainers had allowed it to creep in. Linus took a strong stance against this and actually rejected enabling daemon by default in the Linux kernel. He now has reverted this commit, which includes it on by default. No, we do not make random features default to being on. Very simple, as you can see, this got removed. The default is not yes anymore, it is gone. And why did Linus do this? He's reinforcing a long-standing kernel policy, which is default settings must stay minimal unless the feature is widely used, stable, and essential, which I'm sure a lot of us can agree it is not an essential tool. It's a nice to have tool. Either way, let me know what you think about this. I just think it's funny as this is a little unusual that this was able to slip by Linus Torvalds initially because he gives a lot of attention on what actually gets merged during the release cycle. He normally catches these little types of things, but it also highlights the fact that other maintainers in the Linux kernel who actually allowed this through are clearly not in line with what Linus thinks about this. And in a way suggests that there's some sort of a philosophical difference in what maintainers are thinking as some contributors and maintainers may be actually drifting from the core Linux principles or philosophies. Whether it's intentional or not, the project has to remain disciplined even as the ecosystem and environment grows more complex. It'll be interesting to see how in the future we handle these things, especially when Linus isn't as involved as he is today. In good news, Wayland Protocols 1.45 is now available and comes with some cool new staging protocols, including background effects and pointer warp. These two things are pretty great. Background effects enables compositors to render visual effects behind transparent parts of windows and pointer warp adds functionality to move the pointer programmatically, which are all great things. There's also new experimental protocols that allow clients to restore states, including window positions across sessions and the next gen input method protocol, which is a new work in progress designed for handling input methods. Think on screen keyboards, a very cool development as Wayland continues to evolve to a more capable desktop experience. And the same is true about the Linux kernel as there is a new kernel API specification framework that has been formally proposed and tackles the long-standing challenge of maintaining stable interfaces between the kernel and user space programs. How will it do this? Well, it wants to introduce declarative macros in kernel source to describe APIs. It also would enable machine-readable extraction of system calls and IOCTL specs. It would add a runtime validation via debug FS and detect changes and regressions and add a new tool called KAPI to inspect and export API specifications from source binaries and running systems. You might be asking why this is needed. Well, it would help maintain API and ABI stability to avoid accidental breakages and would create a way to document, test, and validate kernel interfaces. This would bridge the longstanding gap in how kernel user space boundaries are handled. Overall, this framework could dramatically improve the kernel API stability and visibility, making it easier for people to develop distro maintainers to also notice changes, including things like tools, compatibility, reliability, something that the kernel has historically lacked. So it'll be interesting what ends up happening with this tool and framework, but it is exciting to see this. Now we get into some interesting fallout. Enrico Wiglet announced that he is creating an X11 fork called X11 Libre, 
or XLibre for short, after being banned from freedesktop.org. This right here was a post that was preemptive and very dramatic. Enrico claimed that he was going to be banned by Red Hat employees from the freedesktop.org GitLab, resulting in loss of access to his code, merge requests, tickets, and not just for XORG. He viewed this as censorship, rightfully so, and a form of retaliation. He claimed this was against his efforts to modernize X11 and speak openly or criticize the X11 project. Going as far as saying that Red Hat and IBM want to get rid of X in favor of Wayland and take over freedesktop.org, saying that they fired the shot that's heard around the world. Again, very dramatic as he lays out the evil heresies that happened, forking XORG and making actual progress was first thing he wanted to do, talking to a journalist whose name must not be spoken, and inviting anybody to join me without discrimination. Quite an interesting deal here as things broke down quickly. This is in lieu of many challenges that Enrico has been facing, including a lot of reverts that were happening after committing code, such as this Rander cleanup, which led to much conversation. This is a thread from the XORG GitLab issue tracker that illustrates a regression that Enrico made, and this is definitely not the first time. This was caused by code cleanup, which introduced subtle bugs without delivering clear functional improvements, at least from what I can tell, and basically caused XRander not to work anymore on XORG dash git. This clearly wasted community time as commits, which are claimed to have provided little or no user benefit, mainly just moving the stuff around and then introducing a regression. And even with these regressions, this wasn't enough to outright ban Enrico from contributing as he has made many, many contributions as of the last year, being one of the top contributors to the X11 project. Clearly they're passionate for the project, but do not agree with the philosophy of the free desktop.org. And this all led finally to a new fork of the X server under the X11 Libre project, in which we receive a readme file called X Libre X server, a fork of the XORG X server with lots of code cleanups and enhanced functionality. It's probably about time that Enrico moved on and forked his own project. We'll see how things play out as far as the development of this project. Although this really got blown up and took on a political tone, even in the readme file, there's much about big tech, boycotting, firing the shot that the whole world heard, subsidiaries and tax evasion tools, DEI, and making things great again. This political tone seriously undercuts the project's credibility, at least for many, and seemingly a grab for attention coming out of this whole fallout. Honestly, this readme doesn't matter. What we're going to see in the coming weeks is how well this project is able to get other people to maintain and commit code as well as leadership. These undertones here really, in my mind, undercuts the kind of leadership credibility that is critical to managing a large and long-term open source effort. The tone here, at least for me, signals volatility. It's understandable that Enrico is very upset, but this readme feels inflammatory. Healthy leadership avoids framing everything as a battle, especially in community-led efforts, and politicizing things, or at least political baiting, will automatically drive a fork into the road as people will not touch the project on the sheer basis of instability. Overall, a good leader and maintainer does not just write code, they set the tone for how code will be written. It would have been better if Enrico just focused on the code quality, but it's completely understandable as he is taking current fuel and dumping it into the project to perhaps get it going. On the other side of things, the lack of transparency and potential censorship by the free desktop code of conduct team is alarming. Regardless of where you stand, we have no insight to why exactly Enrico was banned and his maintainership status revoked on the X11 project. I understand that this is a way for the code of conduct committee to protect some of the people who are coming out against other maintainers, kind of a protection for whistleblowers, I guess, but regardless, it would be nice to at least understand the reasoning behind the ban, as the current silence is deafening, as this is only splitting the community, not just over the code, but clearly over ideologies. Only time will tell if this project makes it. I'd like to know your thoughts in the comment section below. Do you really think this fork has the ability of maintaining itself in the long term and remaining stable? Time will only tell as Linux unravels a little bit this week. Take a moment to subscribe below and smash that like button on the way back up. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching.